Some of you probably recognize the town that's the subject of this photo. Anyone? Harrisville, exactly. It's Harrisville, but it could really be just about any New England small village across the region. And it's a pretty appealing scene. A quaint historic town, clear lakes, forest and mountains all around. It's pretty tranquil. I moved to this region 11 years ago, seeking to live in a spot kind of like this. And I imagine many of you did too. Or maybe you were born here and decided to stay. Or maybe you left and then decided to come back again. <clears throat> this is not Harrisville. <laughs> <laughs> this is suburban Las Vegas. Classic sprawl. You have to drive anywhere you want to go. Nobody knows their neighbors. Nature is completely sub subjugated. <clears throat> My job as a conservationist is to ensure that places like this don't turn into this. <laughs> and that all the trees and the water and the good things that come from them here don't get wrecked. My job is to ensure that the Monadnock region remains a livable and healthful place to be. But when I lie awake at night, worried that I won't succeed, worried that all my efforts will be in vain, it's not sprawl I'm worried about, and it's not air pollution or recycling or even climate change. It's one little question. Who cares? Who cares about all this nature stuff? Who cares about these matters that, to me, and maybe to some of you, might mean the difference between our children inheriting a habitable planet and a world of scarcity and conflict? <clears throat> and when we consult the statistics on these questions, well, we find that the answer is not that many people. Each January, the Pew Research Center conducts a poll of Americans' priorities of issues for the President and Congress to act on in the coming year. And this year, about 55% of Americans think that the environment ought to be a high priority. But only a paltry 38% think that climate change ought to be a priority. Think about that. There's consensus that New York, Miami, San Francisco, LA may be underwater soon and only 38% of people give a damn. Let's drill even a little deeper. This figure shows the gap in prioritization between the two main political parties. The wider the bar, the more polarized the issue. Climate change and the environment are the first and third most polarized issues right now. This is not looking good. <clears throat> but let's strip away the politics for a moment. Surely the philanthropic sector has its priorities straight. Well, we'd find that we're wrong again. Giving USA publishes an annual report of the preceding year's total charitable giving. And this is a figure of total charitable giving in 2015 divided out by sector. And where's the environment? 3%, almost dead last. OK, maybe here in the Monadnock region, things are a little bit better. The National Center for Charitable Statistics tells us that approximately 25% of New Hampshire households report itemized charitable deductions on their tax returns. And the actual number of people donating is probably a bit higher because not everybody itemizes. And yet, less than 1% of residents of the Monadnock region are donors to my organization, the Monadnock Conservancy, which seeks to keep places like Harrisville looking like places like Harrisville. <clears throat> Why is this number so low? What are we doing wrong? How can you argue against the great outdoors? How can you argue against the hard facts of environmental degradation? The causes are so plain to see. Americans drive too much. We consume too much. The future of the planet is at stake. Or maybe the kind of thinking that I just exhibited is precisely what we're doing wrong. Maybe the outdoors aren't as appealing to others as they are to me. Maybe changing minds isn't as simple as merely presenting the facts. Maybe guilt and fear aren't the best motivators. This is Porcupine Falls in Gilsom. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. 
Anybody can go there. It's a short drive and an easy hike. And uh, though you and I might uh, take it for granted that we'd go for a hike in our free time, that's not necessarily true for other people. And yet it's images like this that have, we've been using for decades to entice people to discover the outdoors. But if you've never spent time in the outdoors, the prospect of going for a hike in the woods could be really scary and intimidating. <laughs> or maybe just impossibly daunting. <clears throat> when I've encountered disagreement in my life, my instinct has always been to present a reasoned argument, to educate. I was trained as a scientist. But it turns out that may not always be the best strategy. Education, the act of education, implies some kind of superiority. I know, and you don't. And that is all well and good for a, a willing student, but not everybody wants to be judged that way. <clears throat> and in fact, the, uh, the Dartmouth government professor, Brendan Nyhan, found that for some deeply held beliefs, facts and reason may actually be counterproductive to changing minds. He assembled a group of research subjects, all of whom were highly skeptical of the practice of vaccination. And when they were showed factual evidence of the efficacy and safety of vaccines, they became even more distrustful of the practice. Apparently, for when a deeply held belief is challenged, human nature is to cling ever more strong, strongly to that, the facts be damned. <clears throat> And the more authoritative the source of the challenge, like a highly credentialed scientist, the deeper the distrust. <clears throat> I recycle. When I leave a room, I turn off the lights and turn down the heat, I try to buy fuel-efficient cars and drive as little as possible. I consider these responsible behaviors even kind of virtuous. But to some people, the, the prospect of an environmentally conscious lifestyle may seem almost monastic, severe. <laughs> like to save the earth, we need to give up all fun and live in the cold and in the dark. <clears throat> Throughout my career, I've had uh, two go-to examples of what can go wrong if uh, conservation fails. Big box stores and housing developments. And in fact, I used an image of a housing development in Las Vegas to illustrate what I try to prevent in my work. But consider what that argument seems like to someone on the opposite perspective. Imagine what it sounds like for me, know-it-all me, to argue against houses for people, or jobs for people, and instead argue for butterflies and bunnies. Imagine how callous it must seem to someone who struggles to put a roof over their head or keep food on the table. <clears throat> At its root, conservation is about uh, controlling how people use natural resources. And some of that control is achieved through influence, but a lot of it amounts to rules. You can't build your house here. You can't cut down trees there. You can't ride your all-terrain vehicle here. You can't hunt there. And if you find yourself on the wrong side of those rules, it's not hard to feel excluded or judged. The whole conservation thing starts to feel a bit like an elite club, and a club to which you are not invited. <clears throat> Am I somehow inferior because I choose to enjoy nature riding on a motorized vehicle? Should I be ashamed that I make my living cutting down trees? Am I some sort of villain because I build houses for people? Who wouldn't feel embittered by this? And so we've established that too few people care about conservation. And this is a problem. So what are we going to do about it? How can we make nature more relevant, more accessible? How can we make nature more relevant to Everyone, not just the people who have the luck of hopping in the Subaru every weekend for an outdoor adventure. <clears throat> well, we can start by asking what people do care about. And the figures that we looked at earlier on tell us precisely that. People care about economic security. They care about jobs. They care about health care, education, kids, nutrition. People care about human needs, and for good reason. Our challenge, then, 
is to frame nature as somehow serving to meet some of those needs. <clears throat> Can nature help advance economic opportunity? Sure. Just ask John and Teresa Janison, the farmer owners of Pete's Stand in Walpole. John and Teresa don't own much of the land they farm. Uh, instead, they're given permission year by year to farm other people's land. And they were losing that land at an alarming rate to commercial development until conservation halted the trend. Can nature help education? Sure. Just ask the kids at the Marlboro School, who have the assurance that the forest adjacent to their school will always be available to them as a natural playground and an outdoor classroom, thanks to a partnership that helps the town buy the property. Can nature advance health? Sure. Just ask the Cheshire Walkers, a group of seniors coordinated by Cheshire Medical Center who meet weekly to go on a hike for social engagement and exercise. <clears throat> I want to close with a metaphor that I think aptly illustrates what we need to do. And this is a metaphor that was uh, introduced to me by the writer and conservationist Peter Forbes. <clears throat> When I was about 10 years old, my best friend and I created a time capsule. And we buried it in the ground, but unfortunately we forgot to note where we had buried it. <laughs> and so we co soon completely forgot about it and never came back to dig it up. In the year 2000, the New York Times decided to create a 1,000-year Times capsule. And like me and my friend, their challenge wasn't so much in what to put in it, but how to ensure that it was kept safe and remembered across the centuries. They asked themselves, what has lasted a thousand years? Well, some religions have lasted a thousand years, but this being the New York Times, they declined to form a new religion to look after their time capsule. <laughs> One guy even had the idea of encoding our millennial relics into the DNA of cockroaches, because clearly they're survivors. <laughs> And they considered all sorts of high-tech schemes for burial and protection of the time capsule, ultimately rejecting each as too expensive. Instead, they thought and realized that the most lasting human institutions are not those that are hidden away. Quite the contrary. The most lasting institutions are those that are openly celebrated. Art, music, architecture. And so, Rather than hide the time capsule away from the ravages of humanity, they chose the unique design of architect Santiago Calatrava, and they installed the time capsule in an outdoor plaza, unguarded, unfenced, for everyone to walk by and touch and see every day. The writer Jack Hitt said, to install it outside meant relying on people to monitor and maintain it for the thousand years. In other words, the survival of the capsule would depend overwhelmingly on culture. I believe that the perpetuity of conservation and the salvation of the environment will be assured when we break down the barriers between people and nature. Like the Times capsule, we need to make nature touchable, tangible, accessible, relevant. <clears throat> we need to abandon the old fortress metaphor, where nature was something to be guarded behind walls or preserved under glass. Instead, we need immersive experiences, chances to get our hands dirty or, God forbid, maybe be a little destructive. <clears throat> we need to retire the unspoiled acre as our one measure of success and instead replace it with the number of lives changed like a little boy who visits a farm on a warm summer afternoon and takes his first bite of a sugar snap pea picked fresh from the vine. Thank you.